it's been a blessing uh, to uh, enjoy here, as, as usual, the music service. I do want to say a special thank you to Don Johnson playing today and uh, appreciated that music. My wife, uh, you'll notice, is absent today. She's in Texas. Uh, so it's just me and the kids, uh, the kids and me here through this weekend. Uh, she had opportunity uh, as a birthday gift to go and visit with her family for the weekend, and uh, we're just enjoying some time together, me and Seven boys and my poor, lonely daughter, my oldest one, the only girl in the house. I asked her, I said, do you feel weird? She says, not any weirder than usual. It's just the way that it is, you know. It's growing up with all these boys. And uh, we're having a good time, though. I was sharing in Sunday school. I was, I was videoing some of my boys the other night. Uh, we'd gotten some ice cream and some chocolate syrup. We made sundaes, things like that, threw some gummy bears on top. And they all sat across at the table at, at the bench. And I got on the other side of the table, and I started to video them going down the line. Started with Eli, and then it was Asa, and then Sam, and, and then little Ezra at the end. And so we go to Sam, I said, tell mom you love her. So he says, love you, mom. Uh, sorry, with Eli, and then Asa does the same, and then Sam, and then it's Ezra's turn. Now, have you ever been in line, and it's your turn to do something, and you forgot? You got caught off guard? Maybe you're in a circle, it's time for you to read. Well, Ezra didn't realize it was his turn to go, I guess. And so everybody else said, love you, mom, love you, mom, love you, mom. We get to Ezra, and he's looking down at his ice cream. He's got his scoop sticks in his mouth. I said, Ezra, it's your turn. He goes, oh, and he says, love you, mom, and the ice cream starts to fall out of his mouth. Got it all on camera. It was a classic moment. I just enjoyed that. Children are a lot of fun. They're a gift from God. And uh, just enjoy the time that I get to spend with them here this weekend, and, and uh, you know, I get to be mom and dad, so to speak, for a weekend, and that's a, a special thing. When my wife was leaving, we left the house on uh, Friday morning at 5 a.m. Didn't have to wake up all my kids. I let the older ones sleep in. I took the younger ones with me because they get up the earliest. That's the way it goes, right? The ones that need your help, they get up before everybody else. In fact, Ezra today was up at quarter after six, bless his little heart, and uh, so I thought I had some time to myself getting up at quarter to six, I had a little bit of time, but uh, he just, uh, uh, it's fun. Well, we took Eli with us. Eli is almost eight years old, and really we could leave him behind, but there's this one thing, and that is he sleepwalks. Now, if we're driving down the road and all his brothers and sister, and his sister, sisters, sisters asleep, upstairs, and he sleepwalks out of the house looking for us, you know, that's a scary thought. There are some things that go through your mind as a parent that you really just kind of tremble to think about, and my wife said, we're not leaving Eli, you know, I don't want him sleeping right out of the house, so we took him with us. There's some things, there's some fears that you have as a parent that you didn't really think about before you had kids. One of the fears in the present day in which we live is the fear that for some reason someone may come and take our kids away especially as our society is growing increasingly hostile to the Christian faith, more and more antichrist. I've heard atheists who say that it is child abuse to teach your children that God created the earth in seven literal days. Child abuse, that sort of thing frightens me because that's a reckless statement. It's not child abuse, it's something that's truth. But you know, that it concerns me. I don't want to see my children ever taken from me. One of my friends, when I was in seminary, had that very thing happen to him. His name was Tom, and he and his wife, they had a, I believe their, their daughter must have been about six months old at the time, maybe nine months old, somewhere in there. They went out on a date, and they left their child behind with a babysitter. When they got back home from the date that they were on, they knew something was wrong. They took her to the emergency room. Turned out her, their baby had been shaken and uh, was suffering the effects and the consequences of that shaking. It wasn't something they had done. It was something the babysitter did. But the DCFS was contacted, and they came, and they took that little girl out of their home. The babysitter later confessed, but still things had to go through courts and proceedings, and it was something like six months before they got their little girl back. Missed all those moments and those first steps and those things that they could never go back and live with their daughter again. And, and you know, as, as a parent, that's one of your worst fears. That's something that you never want to experience, that you want no one to have to suffer through. But take just a thought of that with you into this passage before you today. And understand that's what this poor woman was about to face. We read in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 1 that a woman who was the wife of one of the sons of the prophets, someone training for ministry, he had died. And if that's not enough for this woman to have to endure the loss of her husband and his passing 
now due to the bankruptcy laws of their day, something that you and I, praise the Lord, don't face today in America, but in those days, if you had a debt that you couldn't pay, not only could they come and take all of your material possessions, but they had the right to come and claim your children and use them as their slaves for a certain number of years, up to seven years, and that is what this mother was facing. It was the day that she looked out to Elisha and she cried out, the creditor has come. The creditor has come. There's a lot, of number, a lot of lessons for us to learn in this passage, and I hope to speak to you from this today. Let's ask the Lord to meet with us as we consider this debt, as we consider her deliverance, and ultimately her delight. Let us learn some lessons from the Word of God today. Let's ask the Lord's help in these things, all right? Let's pray. Father, we come to you today, and we're needy people. And Father, Without Jesus Christ, we are debtors to you by our sin debt. There may be some in our midst today that do not know Jesus as Savior. Father, I pray that today you would give them a sense of the terrible reality that sin has its wages and that the debt and the price for their sins is eternity in a lake of fire. Father, I pray that today you would help them to see that Jesus paid their debt on the cross. He rose again, Lord, that today they would receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and come to find eternal life through Him this day. We pray that you would minister to those needs. Lord, minister to the needs of us as believers. Lord, there's many things for us to learn here, and and I, I pray that we would not miss it today. Let the Holy Spirit fill me and use me. Lord, may He speak to each and every heart. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says. And Father, we pray every moment here to be precious in our sight. We would take hold on the truth of your word. And Lord, let it impact us, both the remainder of our lives and for all of eternity. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The creditor has come. The first thing that I'd like for us to note again is the debt that this woman was forced to pay. Again, the Bible tells us, There cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Now knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. The creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen or to be slaves. Now, the Bible doesn't reveal to us here in this verse who this man was who had died and left behind his wife and children and left behind this this large debt that he owed. The Bible doesn't tell us the name. In tradition, people like the historian Josephus and some others have said that the man who was married to this woman who had passed away, that it was Obadiah. Now, Obadiah was one that we met in 1 Kings. Obadiah was a man who feared the Lord. Obadiah was one who actually tried to save the servants of God when Jezebel was doing her purge and trying to kill all of those who worshipped the Lord Almighty. That, that, that Obadiah had hid a hundred of those men in caves and that he had sustained them. Now, if that history is true, if it was in fact Obadiah, we also would learn from that how he came to owe such a large debt. It was because of providing for those men by going and taking out a loan to get the food that was necessary. I mean, can you imagine taking on the responsibility of feeding a hundred people day after day after day? That is what Obadiah had done. He had hid them, he had fed them, And if history is right, we know the Bible is true, it doesn't tell us it's Obadiah, but if history is right, he took on a great responsibility, hoping to pay that off one day. Unfortunately for him, all that he had borrowed, he was not able to pay because death had come into his life. Death had taken his life. And so now his wife is left with that that great debt, and there is nothing that she can do about it. Can you imagine the fear that has taken hold of her heart? She's lost her husband due to his untimely death, and now those two boys, all that she has left in the world, would be taken from her. Can you imagine how her heart must have broken? Can you not see her weeping day after day, crying out to the Lord, going from house to house, going down to to some other loan company or whatever to find some way to pay off the creditor? There was nothing that she could do. I want us to note a few points about this. First of all, I know that if it was Obadiah that there was a good cause that he was so far in debt, but I want to make a spiritual application and understand this. Because of what her husband had done, the children were in grave trouble. 
Well, perhaps the predicament that this woman met with may have been out of her husband's control, something he could not utterly himself uh, control. But in many cases, wives and mothers still today are left high and dry by their husbands physically, financially, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. Today, men leave children oftentimes in a spiritual debt with a, not only a vacuum without that spiritual leadership, but children even have fathers who lead a, a sinful lifestyle, and that sinful lifestyle is something that impacts their lives. We have men today who live in sin. They're careless about the upbringing of their children. They introduce into their homes all sorts of evil, from pornography to addictions to improper values to spiritual laziness. These are dads who stand by and refuse to intervene when their children are pursuing destruction. Can I say today, men, that the debt is going to come due on that one day? We better think very carefully about this reality. Exodus 20 and verse number 5, we read, of the Lord visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. What we do as dads is going to have a powerful impact on the lives of our children We can see in Scripture and learn by observation that what a father struggles with, his son often struggles with. Look in Abraham's life. Look at the things that he fell prey to and then see what Isaac struggled with. Look at how Jacob struggled with so much deceit and living lies and come and see how his children also struggled with that deceit and living lies. Do you see today men and husbands and fathers that what you do is vitally important spiritually? for your children's spiritual well-beings. I remember as a boy, oftentimes I would stay at a friend's house growing up from the time I was about 8, 9, 10, all the way through high school. We had a real good friend. In fact, he was one of my groomsmen when I got married. Uh, he and, and my brother, we, we, went, we even went to work at Walmart together. They called us the three wise men. The three of us, we always worked the same hours. They knew we went to church. We had a good time. But growing up, We'd often be over at his home, and he was in a very godly home, thankful for the testimony of his parents. His father was one of the deacons in the church, and we just had a good time, and they they kept that a very sheltered environment. I'm thankful for that. But we also had a guy in the neighborhood, and because there was three of us, we needed that fourth guy for our basketball games and our football games, and, and so that neighborhood boy would come over and play with us. I remember on one occasion with that neighborhood boy, he brought something out. It was a magazine was a copy of pornography. He had some awful photographs inside that magazine. He opened it up. I looked at him and I said, where'd you get that? He said, I got it from my dad. I got it from my dad. You know, it's a tragedy to understand that. That father himself had led his son into something worse than poverty. He led him into a spiritual bondage. Men, understand today that if we're walking in the flesh... The creditor is coming for us and our family. We better get back to walking in the Spirit and live for God. Get back to leaving a godly legacy behind rather than a burden, a debt. Give your children the treasure of a life. Live for God. An example of living by faith. A testimony of love for God and for your family. In this passage, we can learn some lessons about what we're leaving behind to our children as dads. But there's something else that we can learn. We can learn about this debt. We can see a woman who had a debt that she was utterly unable to pay off. She was totally helpless when it came to doing anything about the debt that she owed. Totally helpless. There's nothing that she could do. She couldn't work a job. She couldn't, in the, in the society in which she lived, she could never get the money to pay this off. This was her plight in life. And the debt had come due. Do you realize today that you and I have a debt that we cannot pay? It's a debt that we could never work enough to pay off, and that is the debt that we call sin. Every one of us have broken God's laws. The Bible tells us that sin is a transgression of the law. Every one of us have broken His laws from whether it's the lies that we have told, whether it's the lust that's been in our heart, whether it's been the angry words that we have spoken. Every one of us are sinners. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That that day, that judgment day, that we meet physical death and ultimately eternal death in a place called the lake of fire is coming upon us. In fact, the Bible says that the wrath of God abides on us. We can almost hear the footsteps of the creditor that is sin coming to us. 
Now that creditor, when he comes, will take us. And again, the Bible says, when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The Bible says that everyone who does not have their name written in the book of life is cast in the lake of fire. You and I have that debt. Now I also want to say there is nothing that you and I can do in and of ourselves to get out from under that debt. We are totally helpless. You could say, well, I'll go to church the rest of my life. I'll give everything that I have to the church. I'll give all that I have to the Lord. I'll follow Him in baptism. I'll try to keep the Ten Commandments. That will do you no good. None of that will pay off your sins. None of that can erase the sins that you've already committed. None of that will stop you from sinning in the future. All of those things are worthless when it comes to saving your soul from sin and from hell. But praise God, a payment has been made that paid all the costs, and that was what Jesus Christ did on the cross and His resurrection. Jesus gave His life. Do you understand what that was all about? When He went to the cross, He died so that you could be free from your sin debt. His payment on your behalf frees you from the creditor that we call sin. Have you trusted Jesus Christ to save you? The Bible says simply, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We can learn something today about the debt that is sin. Furthermore, we can also see in this passage that there is a debt that threatens the lives of others. The Bible tells us, The creditor is come to take unto him my two sons. He's going to take my boy. This is a debt that she not only was unable to pay herself, but she was not able to do anything for her children either. She was helpless, except for this one thing, that she cried out to God for grace. Today around us, I hope that you see all around, just as the song was sung, there's people all around that are carrying a heavy debt, a debt of sin, which unless someone comes to them and shares with them what Jesus Christ has done, that they could see that Jesus paid their debt, that they could receive what Christ has done, that there are countless people around us who will spend eternity in a lake of fire suffering for their sins, which is what we all deserve. But today, we need to take that gospel to help others, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, to help free them as Judgment Day approaches. How have we responded to the needs that are about us? I want us to look in this passage. We consider the dead. Can we also consider today the deliverance? And we look at the deliverance of this woman, God. There's a number of things I want to bring to your attention and really things that we can rejoice in. These are things that ought to excite us because not only was it true in her life, but it's true for us today as well. Let's read in verse number 2. Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? What is it that you want? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Now it seems from the Hebrew that what she had was an ointment that was used in oil, not for cooking, but rather for, uh, for anointing or like medicinal, medicinal purposes, that type of an oil. Then he said, go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and she shut the door upon her house and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And she poured that little bit that she had, and it filled up that container. And they brought another container, and she poured. And it just kept coming. Every container that they brought to her, every vessel that was placed before that oil did not cease until it had filled up every single vessel that they had gathered. And when they had run out of vessels, the Bible tells in verse number 6, it was only then that the oil stayed or the oil stopped. Can we see in her deliverance, first of all, can we rejoice that the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save? His ear is not heavy that he will not hear. Rejoice that with our God nothing shall be impossible. Here we look in this passage, we can see God is good. He saw a woman's need and God is all powerful. He can do anything. Now when you combine those two attributes of our God, that He is good, and that He is all-powerful. What a wonderful truth that is. If that doesn't affect your prayer life, nothing will. You serve a good God, and you serve an omnipotent God. So fill, fill your life with praying to Him and asking of Him great things. What a powerful reality it is. What a comforting combination that is. 
Look at also this woman's deliverance. We can rejoice that his hand can do the impossible, but also as we look at her deliverance, rejoice that the Lord is moved by the cry of the needy. The Lord is moved by the cry of the needy. Both this woman who was helped by this perpetual provision under, under Elisha's ministry, likewise in Elijah's ministry. He helped a woman who was going out to make that last little meal. That's all she had for her and her son, and then they were going to die. That was what she had resigned herself to. I make one final little meal, one last little cake, and that's it. That's all I got, Elijah. The cupboard's empty. We're in the middle of a famine. We're going to die. But the Lord knew her need, and the Lord ministered to that woman. A widow in 1 Kings, a widow in 2 Kings, we see that the Lord cares about the needy people. The Lord cares for the abandoned. Aren't you glad for that today? I remember a classic Western film, and I still enjoy it. I watch it. It's in black and white. It's called High Noon. And maybe you've seen it before. I really like it. It's, you know, you've got this one guy who's going to stand alone. It's Gary Cooper. When you watch this film, Gary Cooper's sheriff in the town. I don't know what the town's name was, but he just gets married that day. Of course, it had to be the day he gets married. That's just the way it works in those old westerns, right? The day he gets married, but Frank so-and-so, who he'd put away in jail many years ago, had just been pardoned by one of those crazy judges, and the guy's coming back to fight him in that town. On that occasion, he's got some friends, Frank does, part of his old gang that are waiting for him down at the train stop. And you kind of pick up in the story somewhere around 8 a.m. I don't know who has a wedding at 8 a.m. on Saturdays, but that's when this guy did, all right? Anyway, he got married early in the morning Saturday, and the clock is ticking. The train comes in at high noon. And there, Gary Cooper, as that clock is ticking, he knows that the gang's there. He goes through the town. Now, this was a town that before he had become sheriff that was just overrun with violence. People everywhere just shooting up the streets. You couldn't, you couldn't find somebody that, was just, uh, that, that could live a decent life. The, the children weren't safe. The, the school couldn't open up. But because he had given his life in that, in that city, that those people now had the freedoms, and the liberty, and the peace that they all had longed for. But that morning as he went and he knocked on those doors, as he tried to get people to come out, and by the way, it must have been a Sunday because church was going on, but he went and he asked everybody to come out and help him. He says, come and help me stand against Frank and his gang. And they said, no, 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 why, why don't you just leave town? We don't need any shooting today. And nobody would come and help him. Even though he had poured out his life to bring about that good in their lives, yet nobody would stand with him. It's a movie, High Noon. But you know, it's something that may have happened in this woman's life herself. Think about it. If Obadiah was, in fact, her husband, then there are at least a hundred men who owed their lives to Obadiah. And now the creditor is coming for her boys. If this is Obadiah's wife, can you not see her going to those men? Can you not see her crying out to those families? Hey, can you give me something? Just a little bit. Just to help pay off this debt. Can you give me something? But she's been turned away. She's totally needy. There was no one there to help her, except the Lord. She came to understand that truth that David once spoke. You remember David in Psalm 27? He said, when father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Aren't you glad for that? When father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. What a wonderful truth that is. You and I today need to realize that we might not be physically needy as this woman was, but every one of us is spiritually needy. We sing a song, I need thee every hour. But I'm so glad that Jesus is there to meet that need, to fill that void for every one of us. We can say with David, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Praise God, we serve a God who delivers us when we are in deepest need. Look at our deliverance as well, and consider this also. Rejoice today that the Lord not only is omnipotent and can do anything, but the Lord also can use anything. God can use anything. Here we find this passage that he asks, what is it that you have in the house? And she says, just a little pot of oil. Just this little vessel. Just this small container. That's all I've got. But our God can do the impossible. And he can use anything. 
We look at in the New Testament, we see Jesus Christ as He came to feed those 5,000. And He asked the disciples to go and, and just kind of find an inventory. What is it that we have to try to feed all these people? And they come back and they say, all we've got is two fish. And, I'm sorry, two loaves, five fish. Or the reverse, sorry, five loaves, two fish. That's all that we've got. What are these things among so many? But in Jesus' hands, we know the song, little's much when God is in it. Praise the Lord for that. God can use anything. And by the way, God can use you. You may look at yourself and you may say, I don't have much. You might say, I don't have much time. You say, I don't have much as far as talents and gifts. I don't have much as far as positions or possessions. I don't have much. But praise God, God doesn't need much. God just wants the little that you have. And God can do mighty things through that little. That's because through that, He is glorified. You know, I look in this passage and I wonder, what did this widow expect? She's crying out to God. Before you read it, what would you think God would do? What would you think that God would use? The reality is, I doubt any of us would say that that's the way that God would perform the miracle. That He would just create that oil to just be an endless supply. So they filled all these vessels and they could go out and sell those things and pay off the debt. I doubt that any of us would have guessed that's what God would do. Aren't you glad that God's not limited to what we expect for Him to do? God can use anything. And He used this little bit of oil in her life. D.L. Moody once said, he said, I am only one, but I am one. He says, I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And that which I can do by the grace of God, I will do. Don't look at how little you are or you have. Look at how great a God you serve. And understand, and from her deliverance, rejoice in that today. Rejoice this in this also, and, and, and this, I, I, this was something that stood out to me. But rejoice in this also, and that's this, that God blesses faith that operates behind closed doors. Did you catch that in this passage? Look again at what Elisha tells her. He says in verse number 4, When thou art come in with all those vessels, he says, Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. This wasn't something for her to do out in public. He says, This is a work for you to do in private. This is behind closed doors. It's the faith, by the way, that's expressed uh, in the, in, not, in the, not the faith that's expressed in the open that's most revealing. It is a faith that is pre, uh, expressed and lived out behind closed doors that is the most revealing about you and me. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. He says, when you're doing your alms or you're doing your giving, when you're doing those acts of mercy, don't do it to be seen of men. He says, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He says, your father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. He talks about our giving. Something that only you and I, I'm sorry, only you and God know. That's it. You and God alone. And when you think about that, that is a work behind closed doors. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 went on. He talked about praying. He said, when you pray, don't be like the Pharisees who come and they, they make those loud trumpets so that all men can hear their praying. He said, no, you go in and you close that, that, do that door to your closet and in that prayer closet you cry out to your God. And he says, your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. He said, when you fast, he says, do that behind closed doors. He's talking about a faith that works not just when men are looking, but a faith that's at work in those secret and private places in your home. Do we have such a faith today? Do we have such an operating faith? We look in this passage, and while we see that the public didn't recognize what was going on behind closed doors, there were some who did see her behind closed doors. She had two boys that watched their mom pour that oil out and saw those miracles in answer to her faith. That while men and women all through town, they might not recognize the faith of this woman, there were two boys there. They saw their mom pouring herself out. They saw those answers to her prayer. Even today, parents and grandparents, there are some who live with you, who come and stay with you. They see you on a daily basis. Do they see acts of faith? Do they see real worship in your life? What a lesson this is for us. God today still blesses 
faith that operates behind closed doors. But notice this also, one final thing, and we consider her deliverance. Rejoice also that the Lord blesses faith that asks great things. Do you see that in all of this, there is one test to her? That one test to her we find in verse number 3. When Elisha gives her instruction, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Now, she's not told exactly how many to get. It's left up to her. There was just this one little thing that Elisha gave, that one snippet. He said, just don't get a few. So she goes out and starts gathering these up. How many would you get? If you were her, how many would you go and and try to bring to yourself? Well, not a few. How many is not a few? Some of us might look at the smallest number. Four is not a few, right? Four, that's more than three. Three is a few. Two is a few. Four is more than a few. I'll just go out and get four or five from my neighbors. After all, I, I, I don't want to be a burden to them and ask them to give me these empty pots and, and have to return them to them. Would we stop at just four? I don't know how many she went and took. I imagine in my mind that she went to every house that she could. I imagine that she went to every home in that village and had every empty pot that was there. Can you imagine what all the neighbors are thinking of this woman? What is this nut going to do? Why does she want my empty pots? Or this pot collector, you know, one of those crazy hoarders, right? Uh, Why is she just getting all these pots together? I was once in a man's home, and I went in there. It wasn't a woman, it was a man. He sat there, and he was surrounded by all these empty mason jars. They just covered his dining room table, his house, his living room, empty mason jars everywhere. Thought, what is this all about? Well, maybe he was going to start pouring out his oil. I don't know. But that's what this woman had done. But that was the test. You see, the oil would flow in direct correlation to how many vessels she had gathered. All that she received was direct and ultimately connected to her faith. If she had five vessels, that's how much she would receive. Thirty vessels, and that's how much oil she would receive. Reminded of the Lord's invitation in Psalm 81, when he makes this statement to Israel, he says, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. Open thy mouth wide and I'll fill it. You know, God blesses faith that asks for great things. Sometimes we ask for so little. Don't be afraid to ask God for much. He's the God who can do anything. Ask God for big things, not recklessly, not from a heart dominated by lust or by greed, but God blesses faith that's motivated by a God who can do the impossible. Because He can do anything, why not ask Him for one of those anythings? One of those impossible things. There's a great truth here also, and that's this. No matter how much she asked, it was never too great a task for God. There was more than enough. Every vessel that she brought to him, he filled to the brim. God's mercies never run out. God's resources never run dry. God's power is never exhausted. God's grace is an endless supply for all that we could need and for all that we could ask or seek or knock. He always has more than enough. And he blessed her great faith. We've seen the debt in this passage. We've seen the deliverance that she received. Can we finally understand, we're going to have to just imagine here today the delight that this must have been. Read again verses 6 and 7 here. It says, It came to pass that when the vessels were full, I can just kind of see her through the course of all of this. Can you imagine just the wonder in her eyes? I can't help but as she's pouring that out, that the tears are just flowing down her face. As, as she's watching this oil fill time and time and time again, I can't help but wonder if maybe she's giggling a little bit, laughing a bit. Maybe, maybe she begins to just cry out to the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, there's another one full. There's another prayer met. There's another need that has been conquered by God. Praise the Lord. But can you see her just step back for a minute? Can you see her as all those things were full and she set them down? There's not anything that's not been filled up that she comes out. She tells that man of God. Can you imagine running to Elisha with this woman? I wonder if her boys were there. Can you you imagine she just came and said, look, all those things are full. Every one of them. It's been a miracle. He said, go back and sell those things now and you will have enough to pay off that debt. 
Can you see this woman with those two boys? Can you see them just falling on their knees? Thank you, Lord. Words can't express. Those two boys, the creditor had come. The court had already begun in session. That time for them to be with her, it's almost up. She's in her last moments. She looks at those little boys. and God answered the prayer. Can you not see them just grabbing and squeezing hold of one another? Those fingers digging into her son's arms. Thank you. I imagine that she went back to those neighbors and said, let me tell you what great things God has done for me. Let me tell you what God can do that nobody else can. Let me tell you what a mighty God we serve. Can you imagine the delight in this woman's life? How do you suppose she would sing if she'd been here today? Can you hear her just sing the words of that song we sang, He giveth more grace. Out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He gives and He gives and He gives again. It just never runs out. God is so good. He's been the same to you and me. He's done the same for you and me. If it weren't for Jesus Christ and the way He poured out His life to fill us, we would still face that creditor and judgment day would be approaching. The words we would hear, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We'd be cast in the lake of fire. But Jesus saved us. He paid it all. He did it all. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. But you know what? There's more than that in this passage. I stopped, didn't I? There's even more. She came to the Lord with one request. Lord, would you you save my sons from the creditor? Would you keep them from becoming slaves? But you know what? He went so much further than that. There's a great verse in the Scriptures that says, Now unto Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. He does more than what we ask. His grace is so great for us. Look in this passage. He said, Go sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. He didn't just pay the debt to free those boys, but He supplied their need for their life going forward. He went above and beyond, and He gave that woman life. He gave her and supplied all of her needs according to His riches and glory. Jesus said in John 10.10, Aren't you thankful for these words of Jesus Christ? I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. David said in Psalm 23, My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Some of the days of my life. No, Christian, all the days of my life. God not only saved me from the pit of hell, but He made me His son. That God made me not only His child, but God gave me the Holy Spirit. He gave me peace and joy. He gave me His promise to never leave me or forsake me. God is with me every step that I take. He's with me all the time. And He's going to see me one day in heaven where He's preparing a place for me. And that's God's blessing on everyone that believes. Everyone, that's our God. He goes so far above and beyond. When you get saved, Jesus paid your debt. But it's not just about the past. It's about providing for your future too. The love, the joy, the peace, the guidance, the wisdom, the appetite and the power to do His will. He gives so much above and beyond just paying our debt. And it's all by grace. You don't know Jesus as your Savior today. Do you realize what you're being offered? He's offering to pay your sin debt completely and in its place give you a home in heaven, the Holy Spirit to fill your life and give you purpose, a peace and a joy that you've never known to change you now and forever. What an invitation! What a God. 
find in Scripture the story of a little five-year-old boy who up until he was five years old had really all that a five-year-old boy could ask. I've got a five-year-old right now, little Sammy. Love those bright brown eyes. He still gets those tears at five years old that can melt your heart. He's got that curiosity, that rambunctiousness. He can run around and play all day long. He got up the other day to go with me to the airport at 5 a.m. I, I, uh, I knew when I was taking him, I said, I'm going to need a nap this afternoon, buddy. So he laid down too. I slept, he didn't. He's five years old, you know. Just awake all day, lots of energy. This little five-year-old boy in Scripture, I'm sure he had no idea what was going on one day when a soldier came running to the house. Started warning all the family, you better run. That little boy's grandpa had been killed. That little boy's dad had died that day. His grandpa was the king. His daddy was next in line. To that point, everything had been just easy. That day, one of the nurses there grabbed hold of him and began to run with him in her haste. She dropped him. Something that he would never recover from. We don't know exactly what the injury was, but he would never run another day in his life. The nurse and the family that remained, they took that little boy and they went into hiding. They tried to lay low. You see, after that day, while his uncle became king for a short time, his uncle was ultimately also assassinated. And that man that his grandfather had tried so desperately to kill, that man that he had probably been told to hate, a man named David, became king. He was now grown up. Perhaps in his late teenage years, he still couldn't run, he couldn't walk. He was stuck at home, just trying and hoping that he could escape, that he could just live just a, a life of poverty, but at least he had life. But he knew when David became king, there could one day be that knock at the door. And it was his creditor, so to speak. You see, because he was one of the king's descendants, he was a very real threat to that throne. It was the practice of that day when a new dynasty was established that every one of the previous king's home would be slaughtered, every one of them mercilessly from young to old. There could be no one that could be a threat to that king. The Phibosheth knew. He knew what he faced. That day, the knock came at the door. He couldn't run. It was useless to fight. They said the king wants to see him, Mephibosheth. His heart must have sunk. He knew this day was possible. Now it had become a reality. He took Mephibosheth, rode him on a donkey, right into Jerusalem. To bring him in before the king, he already had made up in his mind. He had nothing that he could plea. There was nothing that he could promise. There was nothing that he had to offer that king. He had made up in his mind, I'm just going to throw my feet at his mercy. I'm just going to see if, if, if maybe he'll spare my life. And he, he gets in there before the king, he just falls on his face right at the king's feet. And he says, behold, I'm your servant, I'm your slave. David said, Mephibosheth, he said, rise up. He said, I'm giving you all of your dad's lands. And I want you, Mephibosheth, to come and to sit at my table. And I want you to enjoy day after day everything that I enjoy. And Mephibosheth looked at him and he said, what am I? I'm just a dead dog. Why would he be so good to me? I'll tell you why David was good to Mephibosheth. It was because of his relationship with Jonathan. Today, 
We can look back and we can see Mephibosheth not only was spared in his life, but he lived like a king for the rest of his days. It's something for you and I as well to relish. Because Jesus Christ has paid our sin debt, we live as kings and priests. We have so much that this world can't even know, and it's ours forever. And it's not because we're something special in and of ourselves. It's because of Jesus and His grace to us. We must never cease to remember what great things He has done. Do you know Jesus today as your Savior? Has your debt been paid? Have you received all that Jesus Christ offers, the eternal life, the forgiveness of sin? Do you know Him as your Savior? It's an urgent matter. As the creditor came for this woman and her sons, your judgment day is coming as well. Do you know Jesus today? Let's pray. Father, we come to you today thankful for the opportunity to look into your word, to learn a few lessons in this woman's life. And Lord, we're thankful that we can look there and we can see that while she turned to others and found no help, that Lord, she found hope in you. Lord, you paid that debt and you gave her life abundantly more than what she could have ever imagined. And Lord, you've done the same for us. and We rejoice. We say thank you today. Lord, as your people... It's easy for us to just grow to, to murmur and to complain and to see what we're missing. Father, help us to renew our focus and to see all that we have in you. You've been so good. It's unquestionable that you are a good and gracious and merciful God to us. Oh Lord, today I pray for those that don't know you as Savior. They have not trusted Jesus Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection. And Lord, today I pray that you would show them that. Father, show them their need. Lord, I pray that you would give them that desire to know Jesus, to receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life with you forever. Lord, I pray by your grace, speak to their hearts. For we as your people, Lord, we want to we have great faith, but not just before the crowds. Lord, we want it behind closed doors like this woman had. Lord, to see those answers to prayer and to rejoice in seeing how you provide time and time and time again. Oh, Lord, speak to our hearts today, we pray. Thank you for this time. We pray your hand be with us and bless us in this invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.